Hello, welcome to part two of my series of tutorials covering the Shader Node asset pack I released recently, SDF Nodebox. Today, I will walk you through how to recreate the crown example I included in the pack. This video aims to show you how you can use the nodes in the pack to combine and modify SDFs to create more complex composite shapes. Okay, starting from a fresh scene with nothing done, I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna drag this up and open up the asset browser and then, oh, and then expand all of these here which then gives me quick access to all of the nodes that I have in my, in my node pack that I created. And then from there, I'm gonna drag out a window to the side here and switch this over to the shader editor and change it over to the world. Because we're gonna be working with 3D SDFs today, the easiest way to preview what, we, what we're working with is with the world volume shader. However, we're gonna run into an issue because SDFs have a positive value outside of the shape that they define. Because of that, unless the camera is inside the shape, we're not gonna be able to see anything because it's just gonna be filled with volume outside the shape. So the easiest way to preview it, if you're using my note pack here, is going to be the preview 3D SDF, which will take an SDF input and output a color that we can plug into the volume that will make it much easier to see what we're working with. To show what the 3D preview looks like, I'm gonna switch over to the rendered view, go over to my 3D primitives and drag in the SDF box, plug that in. We're not gonna see anything yet, because, or well, we're gonna see red, but we need a proper vector for this, for the texture coordinate space. I'm gonna grab the texture coordinate node and I'm, I'm gonna plug in the object, which will just use world space as the object because it's the world. And now as I zoom in, this is what we get. If you have res a result like this, where it's a little stripey and with very little, like it doesn't look like it has a lot of resolution, what you can do is you gotta make sure you're in Eevee as well, is you can just increase the viewport sampling to say 100 and that should make it much sharper. Another thing that can improve the performance quite a bit is if you go over down to volumetrics and drop the tile size down to two pixels, it'll also make it much sharper as well. Now, what are we looking at here with this representation? Because SDFs have a positive value outside the shape, it's very difficult to see a 3D SDF using the volume node because like I was saying earlier, it just fills the entire world with a ton of volume. So what's going on here now is what all the different colors represent is the white, the thin white shell here is very close to the zero value of the shape. The blue values or the blue stripes radiating, radiating away are the positive values. And then the red on the inside are the negative values of the sine distance field. If you're not familiar with what an SDF or sine distance field is, go watch the first part of this series uh, where I explain what that is. For these videos, I'm assuming you've already seen that. But now let's start working on the, on recreating the crown example. So the first thing that we're going to create is the band of the crown, as that's kind of the biggest and most obvious part of the crown. So to do that, the first thing we're gonna do is create a circle. Now, there isn't a cylindrical prism thing here, which is what we would want for that, but what we can, but it's very easy to make. What we can do is we can take the 2D circle SDF, and if we plug everything in, what we'll see is that, ah, I see what happened, I plugged in UV instead of object. So if I plug an object into this, what we'll see is we'll have a pillar going up infinitely in each direction. This is because it's a 2D SDF, so the Z axis doesn't exist, so it just treats it as it's zero, so it just goes all the way through. What we can do now though, is we can go to operations and drag out extrude 2D SDF to bring this into the 3D space. So for this, we need both the vector that we're putting in and the 2D SDF that we're outputting here. And when we plug this in here, we now have a nice cylindrical prism or cylinder. And with the extrude 2D, we can control the height of the prism as well as move it up and down in world space. But now we need to hollow it out because in the, because you know, with a crown, it's hollow in the center, which is also very easy to do. So what we're gonna do here is take an outline of the circle before we extrude it. So I'm gonna plug the SDF into SDF here and this SDF into the 2D SDF of the extrude. And as you can see, it's now hollow. I can control the thickness of it here. Looking at the example that I had, the values that I used for it there were 1.75 for the radius of the circle and 0.15 for the outline thickness. And this will give gives us a good starting point for the uh, band of the crown. So now I've just moved some stuff around here in the nose just to tidy it up a bit. But one thing you'll notice about the crown example that isn't shown here is the band isn't this thick all the way around. It kind of tapers up into a point. And we can achieve that effect through utilizing some math. So stick around with me here. I'll, I'll explain what I'm doing here. So now if we take 
this vector that we're inputting here and we separate it out into the di different x, y, and z coordinates, we can then put this into a an arc tan2 node. What this is going to do, and you need to be careful here, you need to go y, y is first and then x, or else they'll get the wrong value. So what the arc tan2 node does is it converts an x and a y coordinate into a value between negative pi and pi for the angle that that position is at. So if I instead detach this here and then plug the output of this into the surface, and then instead of using the object coordinates, use the camera coordinates into here, you can kind of see, and I'll turn off the grids and stuff so you can see, you can kind of see what this is doing. So we've got a gradient from here to here, and this is what this is going to do in 2D space because we're using the X and the Y here. So this is going to give us a number, this is going to tell us the angle of this. However, between negative pi and pi isn't very useful. So what we're going to do here is output this to a remap node. Sorry, a map range node. And from there, we're going to do negative pi to pi. And then from the, for the input and then to the output, we're going to do zero to one. And if we input this into the surface, you can see now we've got a smooth gradient from zero here all the way to one here. And one thing I've just noticed is that it's not going to exactly look right here because go over to the color management here. The view, trans, view transform is set to filmic. But if we set this to standard, this will look better because now that it, there's no view transform applied. We're just seeing the raw values of the output here, which is useful if you're doing, if you just want to see what the value is. If I plug in the object coordinates instead of the camera coordinates, we'll get these values on a 2D plane around the origin of the world. However, for the math that we want, we don't want a smooth gradient like this. We want a smooth fall off from the front of the crown where the point is, and we want a smooth fall off off to the back rather than this harsh transition here. What I'm instead going to do is output this to a ping pong node. And now if I view this, we now have it mirrored on both sides. So it's a smooth transition from the front here to the back and vice versa. We don't have the harsh cutoff at the one point where it goes directly from one, a value of one to a value of zero. So if I instead plug this value into the height of the extrude 2D SDF, and then plug this back into the color, and of course switch this back from object, from camera to object, you can see now that we have a taper where it's uh, taller in the front and then thinner at the back. However, we want to be able to control this. Another thing that you'll notice though, is that it's not flat on the bottom. That's applying this height both to the top and the bottom, whereas we want it to be a flat bottom here. So another thing we can do is if I just create a reroute here and plug this into the Z, the Z position as well, it'll also offset it by the same amount as the height that's creating, which will give it a flat bottom here. So for each position here, it's given a specific height and then also moved up to that, that same amount of height, which is what creates the flat bottom. However, like I was saying earlier, this is just going to be a fairly linear gradient, whereas we want to be able to control it, control the curve of it. So what we can do is output this to a float curve and then plug this back into here. Now it's just a linear curve with no change, but now I can click here and drag this around and it's gonna start doing stuff. Like here we can get this weird curve just by changing the curves in this node. Now I'm just gonna go in and reset the curve here. So we're back to the, where we started. If we click this button here, you can use you can find the bounds of the view of the curve here. And one thing we wanna do is change the max to 0.5. And we want to do this because when we do the ping pong, what the ping pong does is it lets the value increase up to the scale that we have here, up to the value for here. So the input gradient that we have here keeps increasing as normal until it reaches 0.5. And after 0.5, the gradient reverses and goes back down to zero. So the highest value that we have on the gradient is 0.5. So we want to treat that as the max value here. Now, if I move this around, it'll readjust. And there you go. We can see that now it's a much more dramatic curve because now we've got a value of one at where it was 0.5 before. So now you can put whatever you want into this curve to make your crown. But to match the crown that I have in the example, I'm going to change the points around like this. I'm going to put one over here, right at the top at zero. Another one right around here to give it the curve. And then at the back of it, which is actually looking like the front now, I'm going to move this point down to about here. And this should give us a curve that is, or a crown band that is very similar to what we have in the example. Okay, I've just moved some things around again just to clean up the notes. In fact, I'm gonna just put another reroute here just to clean it up some more. Now the band is almost fun done, but we're missing one thing, which is in the example, there is a jewel right at the top here. Now to create this jewel, we're gonna use the octahedron SDF. So I'm gonna drag this in here, which gives us this. And then from there, I'm gonna drag out another node from this reroute over here. 
Okay, another reroute just for organizing stuff and line these all up like so. And now if I plug the octahedron into the preview, you can see this here. Now in the example, I had a size of 0.5. So I'm going to do that here. And now we need a way to join this octahedron with the band that we already created. And for this, I'm going to use a smooth union. If we plug both of them in and then look at the SDF, we can see both the octahedron and the band. What's unique about the smooth union though, is that if I move the octahedron off to the side here, you can see that the octahedron and the band are starting to smoothly join together, similar to what you'd see with metaballs. I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe metaballs are actually done using sine distance fields, but I'm not actually sure about that. I'm not sure of another way that you'd be able to do that though. But if I do this, and especially if I drag up the smoothing factor on the smooth union, but you can see that they just kind of blob together in a single shape. So then what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna try and match the transform of that I had in the example, which is negative 1.75 on the x and a, and a position of 2 on the z puts it pretty close and i'm going to bring down the smooth union smoothing factor to 0 0.3 which is what i have in the example and there we go we have the crown band and the jewel smoothly joined together at the top so now all we have left to do is add the jewels around the outside here now before we move on to doing those i'm just going to put a frame around all these just to keep it organized. And to create the jewels, we are also going to use an octahedron. And just for now, let's drag this over and plug the octahedron into the preview 3D SDF. We're gonna line up the nodes to create a single jewel, and then we're gonna radial, radial array those around the outside of the band. But of course, the jewels on the crown example don't just look like a plain octahedron, but the octahedron is the starting point. So now that we've got the octahedron, what we can do is we can take the elongate SDF here. And now how this works is we'll need to plug in the same vector that we started with. And this is just going to modify the vector that we plug into the, uh, the, octa to the SDF here. So now it looks the same because we're just working with the size of 0, 0, 0. But if I start increasing the value of x, and I'm looking at a poor angle to display that, but if we start increasing the x, we'll see that it's going to start elongating the center of it which gives us, which we can use to kind of create that look that we had in the example. So to kind of create that look, I'm gonna start with a zero on the X. I'm gonna go with 0 0.1 on the Y and then increase the value of the Z and we've got our jewel. Except that I forgot to reduce the size of the octahedron, which is why it looks a little weird. So in the example, I had a size of 0.15. So now if we look at it and I reduce the size, we're starting to get the example jewel that we want. But again, we still need a way to combine it with the band that we already have. So for that, we're just gonna use another union, but we're not gonna do a smooth union this time. We don't want it to blob in with the band, which is what we were doing before. So instead, I'm just gonna take a regular union SDF, drag this out, should be able to just drag it on top of the line there to add it and add the smooth union SDF into this union here. And now we've got both the jewel and the band that we had before. And now to get it to go around the, the front of it here, what we're gonna use is the repeat radial here. And again, we should just be able to drag this on top of the vector line here, but we're not gonna see anything yet other than it's now a triangle instead of a uh, just a square that it was before, but now in order to move it out, we need to move it out along the x-axis until we're just outside the band. And now we can see that we've got the our three copies of it. Again, you can set your amount of copies to whatever you want, but I'm gonna match the example that I had before. And before I had a segment count of 18, which I felt gave a nice amount of spacing around the band. Now, the last issue we need to deal with is that we've got way too many of the jewels going all the way around. In the example, they end up uh, ending right about halfway along the band and they also increase in height as they get closer to the front of the band. We're going to do a similar thing with the jewels as like what we did with the band to create this curve here in that we're going to input a value that changes into their height and position in order to get them into the right uh, right spot. And to do that, instead of using the angle from the arctan2, we're just gonna use the segment ID. This is going to give a different integer value for each of the repeat radial. You'll have a similar thing from both the repeat infinite, will give you a cell ID, and so will the repeat finite. They all give you cell IDs. So this is the same kind of idea. And from there, we're gonna divide our cell ID by nine. This is because we've got 18 segments here, so we've got 18 joules. But we want to make sure that everything happens is mirrored. So we're dividing it by nine instead of by 18. If using the same camera to vector to world output 
that I was, trick that I was using before, you, and if I plug in the segment ID here, you'll see that we'll have one segment here that is zero, and everything else is white, because it's all got a value above one, and one is going to be the highest that it'll, uh, that it'll display. You'll see some bloom here just because I have bloom turned on here. This gives, if I turn this off, you'll see a much better representation of it. And now if I plug the output of the division in, you'll see that we've got all these extra segments now. So now this is, you know, zero. This is going to be one over nine, uh, two over nine, three over nine, and so forth. Until we get to here where it is now one again. But now we want to do the same thing that we were doing before where everything is mirrored from the front. So I'm going to plug this into a ping pong, the same that I did before. And now we've got this, only we've got two mirrors. We've got, you know, one black or two blacks, two point fives. What we want to do instead is ping pong at the value of one. So now it goes all the way up to one and then starts going back all the way down to zero. And each of these bands are going to represent uh, one of the jewels. So that each jewel, so this jewel that it will be here will have a value of one. This will be a little bit less, a little bit less until you get to a value of zero here. So now I'm going to switch back to viewing the volume and plug the object coordinates back in here. Now what I'm going to do, because I want to be able to plug this value into the Z value of the elongate, I'm going to take this out into a combined XYZ, which will let me put in, in individual values into this. And then I'll plug this value into the Z and you'll see here that the joules start small at the back and then gradually increase in size until they get to the front. Like we like we want it. I'm just going to increase the Y again to 0.1 to give them the width back. Now we need to line up the bottoms here. But if we try and do the same thing that we did before by just plugging in this value into the Z value of the position here, you're going to see that we're actually going to run into a problem. So I'll put two back on the X. And if I plug this value into the Z, you'll see that everything kind of breaks. And this is just because of how the elongate SDF works. So we actually need to do to do this translation before we do the elongation. And we can do that by using the mapping node. If I stick this in between here, I can then do a combine off of the location here. And then I can plug this value out of the ping pong into the Z value of the combine XYZ. And you'll see that everything gets shifted down. This is because the mapping is set to point. We're going to want to set it to texture. Again, though, we want to be able to use a curve to define the height of these jewels rather than just having it be linear so that then we can get it to match the height of the band like we had before. So to do that, I'm just going to draw a line across here to create a single output. And then again, I'm going to use the float curve and output that into the reroute. So now again, we're going to change, be changing the bounds a little bit because we actually want the values in the back to disappear. So then they only, you only have jewels in the front half. I'm actually going to be able need to go need to put the values in the curve in the negative. So for that, I'm going to change the minimum Y to negative 0.5. And then what we need to do is reset the view in order to actually see the negative bound here. And so now as I drag this down, you can see that the back values in the jewels actually start to disappear. So now we've only got jewels in the front. Now in order to create a curve that is similar to what I had in the example, I'm going to do something along the lines of this, putting one value here, another value about here, next value around here-ish on the line there, and the last value about here. Maybe I'll move this one down a little bit, and this gives us something pretty close. The only issue now, though, is if we look right from the side, we still have a little bit of the jewel sticking out below the band, and this can be fixed very easily just by adding a little bit right before we add it into the combined XYZ. So if we add this here between the reroute and the combine, set this back to zero, and we get what we had before, and I'm just going to hold shift and drag this up just until it looks like it's just above the band. All right, and if you've made it this far, you have successfully recreated the crown example that I include with the SDF Nodebox asset pack that I've just released. If you're interested in purchasing that, the link will be down in the description. Thank you for sticking around and watching. I hope you have a great day.